Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Learning Stethoscope. Today, we're diving into stress urinary incontinence, the most common type of incontinence, especially in women. Let's start with some definitions. Urinary incontinence is simply defined as the complaint of any involuntary leakage of urine. In other words, if someone says they lose urine when they don't want to, that's incontinence. Now, there are several types of urinary incontinence, but today we're focusing only on stress urinary incontinence. According to the International Continence Society, the definition of stress urinary incontinence is the complaint of involuntary loss of urine on effort or physical exertion, or on sneezing or coughing. So basically, this means it's an involuntary loss of urine whenever there's a sudden rise in intra-abdominal pressure. For example, when laughing, coughing, or exercising. Now, to really understand stress urinary incontinence, we first need to review how normal urination incontinence work. The urinary bladder is a muscular reservoir that stores urine. Its wall is made mainly of the detrusor muscle, which is smooth muscle. Keeping urine inside the bladder are two important sphincters. The internal urethral sphincter, made of smooth muscle and under involuntary control. The external urethral sphincter, made of skeletal muscle and under voluntary control. But continence isn't just about the sphincters. The pelvic floor muscles are also essential. They act like a supportive hammock, holding the bladder and urethra in the right position and providing extra closure force when needed. This coordinated system, the bladder, sphincters, and pelvic floor, is essential for maintaining normal continence. So, if there is any weakness or dysfunction in these structures or in their neural control, it can disrupt the balance and lead to involuntary loss of urine, or in another words, urinary incontinence. Micturition has two main phases. The first is the storage phase, in which the bladder slowly fills up with urine. The detrusor muscle stays relaxed, while the sphincters and pelvic floor muscles remain contracted to keep urine in. Now, as the bladder fills, stretch receptors send signals to the brain. And when the moment is appropriate, the system switches to the voiding phase. In the voiding phase, the brain coordinates the process so that the opposite happens. The detrusor muscle contracts while the sphincters and pelvic floor relax, allowing urine to be pushed out and urination to happen. So, we can see that micturition depends on this finely tuned teamwork between the bladder, sphincters, pelvic floor, and nervous system. And if there is any weakness or disruption in one of these players, it can upset the balance and result in urinary incontinence. Now, let's take a closer look at the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor is made up of muscles and connective tissue that form the base of the pelvis. On a side view, you can picture it like a muscular hammock stretching from the pubic bone at the front all the way to the coccyx at the back. Now, these muscles don't just sit there. They actually surround and support the pelvic organs, such as the bladder, vagina, and rectum, helping to keep them in place. So, when the pelvic floor muscles are strong and healthy, they provide dynamic support to the bladder, contributing to maintain urinary continence. But if these muscles weaken or lose tone, problems like prolapse or incontinence can appear. From a superior view of the pelvis, we can see how the different muscles come together to form the pelvic floor. First is the pubic coccygeus, shown here in orange. That runs from the pubic bone to the coccyx, forming an important sling that supports the pelvic organs. Then we have the puborectalis, in pink, that starts from the pubic bone and goes posterior, wrapping around the rectum like a sling. This muscle is crucial for maintaining rectal continence. Next, we have the iliococcygeus, in blue, which extends from the tendinous arch of the obturator fascia to the coccyx, giving broad support to the pelvic viscera. And finally, we have the coccygeus muscle, in purple, running from the ischial spine to the coccyx and reinforcing the posterior pelvic floor. Together, these muscles form the pelvic floor. Notice how they wrap around the urethra, vagina, and rectum. When the pelvic floor muscles contract, they perform two key actions. First, they lift upward, supporting the bladder, urethra, and other pelvic organs. And second, they tighten around the urethra, increasing closure pressure and reinforcing the sphincters. 
Together, these actions help maintain continence, especially during sudden increases in abdominal pressure, like coughing or laughing. Now that we understand how continence normally works, let's move on to the pathophysiology of stress urinary incontinence. In simple terms, there are two main mechanisms that can lead to stress incontinence. On the first scenario, we have weakness of the support structures such as the pelvic floor muscles. As a result, the urethra and bladder neck lose their stability causing urethral hypermobility, especially in moments where the abdominal pressure increases like coughing or sneezing. Now, there's a simple bedside test to check for urethral hypermobility called the Q-tip test. In the Q-tip test, the patient lies down and a lubricated cotton swab is gently inserted into the urethra until it reaches the bladder neck. At rest, the angle of the Q-tip is observed, usually is near horizontal. Then the patient is then asked to cough or perform a Valsalva maneuver. If the Q-tip rotates less than 30 degrees upward, then this means that the urethral support is considered normal. But if the Q-tip rotates more than 30 degrees upward, then this it indicates urethral hypermobility, often associated with stress urinary incontinence. The second mechanism for stress incontinence is intrinsic sphincter deficiency. In this case, the problem isn't with the support structures, but with the sphincter itself. Here, the internal and external sphincters are unable to generate enough closure pressure, even if the urethra is well supported. This means that even a small increase in abdominal pressure, like a cough or laugh, can be enough to cause urine leakage. Typical causes include aging, nerve injury, pelvic trauma, or treatments like pelvic surgery and radiation. Several factors can increase the likelihood of stress urinary incontinence by weakening the pelvic floor or impairing urethral function. During pregnancy, the growing uterus increases intra-abdominal pressure constantly pushing down on the bladder and pelvic floor. At the same time, hormonal changes soften ligaments and connective tissues, reducing pelvic support. These adaptations make the continence system more vulnerable, which is why some women notice leakage during pregnancy. Vaginal birth can overstretch or tear pelvic floor muscles and tissues. There may also be injury to the pudendal nerve-reducing sphincter and pelvic floor muscle control. In some cases, an episiotomy, meaning a surgical cut in the perineum to facilitate delivery, may further weaken the pelvic tissues. On the other hand, a C-section is often thought to be protective because it avoids direct vaginal trauma. Women who deliver by cesarean generally have a lower risk of stress incontinence compared to those with vaginal deliveries. However, pregnancy itself already stretches and weakens pelvic tissues, so it remains a significant independent risk factor, even without vaginal birth. With aging, there is a natural decline in muscle tone and collagen support. And after menopause, the decreased estrogen can cause atrophy of the urethral mucosa and further weaken pelvic tissues, all of which increase the risk of stress incontinence. Obesity can lead to a chronic increase in intra-abdominal pressure, as well chronic cough and constipation. Pelvic surgeries like hysterectomy can weaken or damage the ligaments, connective tissues, and nerves that normally support the bladder and urethra. Neurological conditions such as spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, or diabetic neuropathy can impair the control of the bladder, sphincters, and pelvic floor muscles, making stress incontinence more likely. Now that we've covered the risk factors, let's talk about how stress urinary incontinence actually shows up in patients. The hallmark symptom is involuntary leakage of urine during activities that suddenly raise intra-abdominal pressure, things like coughing, sneezing, laughing, exercising, or even simply standing up. Some patients notice it only during high-impact efforts, while others may experience leakage, even with minimal exertion. When we take a clinical history, it's not enough to just confirm the presence of leakage. We need to carefully characterize the symptoms, not only to confirm the diagnosis, but also to monitor the effectiveness of treatment over time. After confirming the type of incontinence, it's important to assess the severity. So, what type of efforts trigger the leakage? Is it only during big efforts like jumping or running? Or does it also happen with minimal activities such as walking, 
standing, or lifting a light object. Next, clarify the quantity of urine lost, a few drops versus larger amounts, and the frequency, so how many times per day or per week. Don't forget to ask about associated symptoms such as urgency, hematuria, or pain, which may suggest other conditions. A detailed obstetric and gynecologic history is essential. Number of pregnancies, complications, type of deliveries, meaning vaginal or cesarean, history of episiotomy or forceps, and whether the patient is postmenopausal or on hormone replacement therapy. Then, explore lifestyle factors and functional impact. How does the leakage affect daily activities, work, or social life? What's the fluid intake like? Is there caffeine or alcohol consumption? And importantly, how are the bowel movements, since chronic constipation and straining can worsen incontinence? Finally, ask about previous treatments. Has the patient tried pelvic floor exercises, medications, or devices before? Were they effective? And was there adherence? Once we've gathered a good history, the next step is the physical examination with special attention to the pelvic exam. The first step is inspection. Look for signs of vaginal atrophy, common in postmenopausal women, scars from childbirth or surgery, and any evidence of pelvic organ prolapse. Also check for signs of infection or inflammation. Then we can do a stress test. In the stress test, we ask the patient to cough, sneeze, or perform a Valsalva maneuver. If there is any leakage of urine, this suggests either urethral hypermobility or pelvic floor weakness. If there is no leakage, then it may indicate either normal support or that symptoms only occur under certain conditions not reproduced in the exam. The next step is the pelvic floor muscle assessment. This is best done by digital palpation through the vaginal wall, and we can evaluate the strength using the modified Oxford scale. This classifies the strength of the contraction from zero to five where zero is no contraction and five is a strong contraction felt as a squeeze and lift. Then is the endurance, where we feel how many seconds the patient can sustain a contraction. And we can also ask the patient to perform quick contractions. This allows us to assess their ability to rapidly activate the pelvic floor muscles, which is especially important in situations of sudden increases in intra-abdominal pressure, such as coughing or sneezing. This functional assessment helps guide rehabilitation strategies, especially pelvic floor training. Finally is the neurological examination, where it is important to check sacral reflexes, perineal sensation, and motor function. After the clinical history and physical examination, additional tests may be requested to clarify the diagnosis or assess severity. These are not always necessary, but can be very helpful in selected cases. First is urinalysis, to rule out urinary tract infection, the post-void residual urine, measured by ultrasound or catheter, where we check how much urine remains in the bladder after urination. The PAD test, a simple way to measure urine loss. In this test, the patient wears a pre-weighed pad while performing daily activities or stress maneuvers. After a set time, the pad is re-weighed, the increase in weight corresponds to urine leakage. This helps us to quantify the severity and monitor the treatment. Then we can ask for a voiding diary, which is a patient-recorded log of fluid intake, voiding times, and leakage episodes over several days. It provides valuable information about patterns and impact on daily life. Finally, we have the urodynamic studies. These are reserved for complex or refractory cases to objectively evaluate bladder function, urethral pressure, and detrusor activity. Now that we've covered how stress incontinence is diagnosed, let's move on to treatment. The first step is often simple lifestyle modifications. These changes may not completely eliminate leakage, but they can significantly reduce symptoms and improve quality of life. The first one is weight management. Because excess abdominal weight increases pressure on the bladder and pelvic floor making leakage more likely, even a modest weight loss can make a difference and reduce incontinence. Then is fluid and diet adjustments. Limiting caffeine, alcohol, and carbonated drinks can help since they irritate the bladder and worsen symptoms. Then is smoking cessation. 
smoking doesn't just harm the lungs. Chronic coughing repeatedly strains the pelvic floor and bladder support. It's also important to achieve regular bowel habits because constipation increases intra-abdominal pressure and pelvic strain. A fiber-rich diet, hydration, and healthy bowel habits help protect the pelvic floor. Last but not least is bladder training. Timed voiding schedules or regular bathroom visits can reduce accidental leakage, especially in women whose leakage occurs once the bladder gets too full. So, lifestyle changes are a good starting point, but for many women, they're not enough on their own. The good news is that the pelvic floor can be trained just like any other muscle. Strengthening these muscles is one of the most effective first-line treatments for stress urinary incontinence. Done correctly, it can reduce leakage episodes, improve urethral support, and even prevent worsening over time. Pelvic floor training can be done independently at home or under the guidance of a physical therapist. The cornerstone is Kegel exercises, which involve repetitive contractions of the pelvic floor muscles. These are usually recommended every day, about three times a day. And just like with any workout, you can gradually increase the difficulty. Start by doing the contractions lying down, then seated, then standing, and eventually during activities like lifting or coughing. To support consistency, many women find mobile apps or reminder tools helpful. For patients who struggle with very weak muscles, electrical stimulation can be used to help activate pelvic floor fibers. Another useful technique is biofeedback. Here, a small device with sensors is inserted in the vaginal canal. This device allows to record the strength and duration of each contraction, giving visual or auditory feedback. This helps patients see their muscle activity, learn the correct technique, and track progress over time. Regarding devices, one option is the pessary. This is a vaginal device that provides mechanical support to the urethra and bladder neck. By lifting the bladder into a more anatomic position, it reduces leakage. It's especially helpful in women who also have pelvic organ prolapse. Medications play only a limited role in stress incontinence. Topical estrogen, as a cream or vaginal ring, may be useful in postmenopausal women. It improves the health of the urethral mucosa and increases vascularity, which can enhance closure and reduce leakage. When conservative treatments fail or if symptoms are severe, surgery may be considered. The most common procedure is the mid-urethral sling, where a synthetic or autologous sling is placed under the urethra to provide firm support during increases in abdominal pressure. Another option is the use of bulking agents. These are injected around the urethra to improve its closure, similar to how cosmetic fillers add volume in the face. This is typically reserved for patients who are not good candidates for more invasive surgery. And that's it. Stress urinary incontinence explained. We covered everything from anatomy and physiology to the causes, risk factors, diagnosis, and the different treatment options. If you found this video useful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the Learning Stethoscope for more medical videos. Stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one.